Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Good to be back, and we have a wonderful section of the country here. All our, our family, and they come from miles and miles, and they drive for hours and hours. I just ask our dear Lord to bless them in many, many ways because they, they're tired by the time they get here. So I ask our Lord to give them a little boost that only He can give. Well, I'm sure all of you, and maybe some of you don't know today, and Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Of course, today we've kind of went overboard with all the devotions, and so so many of you don't have the slightest idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've got to tell you, this is a scapular. Here it is. <clears throat> Now, if I can maneuver this without everything falling, i will be fine. Now, please don't move. No, it's going to move. Okay, here we go. This is a scapular. Any bets it'll move? <laughs> okay. This is a scapular. Ordinarily, they're brown. This is brown, but it doesn't matter. This has to be brown and wool. A little itchy, but it won't hurt you. Many miracles have been wrought by this scapular. You have to be enrolled in it, and you have to be, you, you have to have to put around your neck by the one who enrolls you. And all our sisters, most of us, the old ones anyway, we're enrolled when we had our first communion. You put it around your neck, see, like this, and you wear it. You say, that's a superstition. Uh-uh-uh, don't say that. Our Lady herself gave it to St. Simon Stock. I'm going to read this to you. Beside that, when she appeared to the children of Fatima, she appeared as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the Holy Scapular. Now, I'm going to read you a little bit of this because I think everybody, every Catholic, every non-Catholic listening, it may not be too bad if some Muslims and other people were. Because Muslims love Our Lady. Did you know that? They do. Because she's the mother to them of the great prophet. But they love Our Lady. And anybody that loves Our Lady, She's going to intercede for them. I'll tell you a little bit about this, and then we'll go on with our little talk tonight. The brown scapular is a um, sacrament. You have to be enrolled by a priest. And priests, cardinals, everybody wears one, or they used to. It represents the garment of Our Lady, and it's like you're wearing a little bit of piece of, of material that belongs to her. It's a great protection, a great protection against many things. You say, oh, that's superstition. 
if God says something and you should wear it, it's not superstition. It's obedience. Okay, here we go. Simon Stock was a man showed by God to the great work of the Carmelite order. About 1251, when things seemed to be insurmountable, Our Lady appeared to him and made the scapular of the Carmelite habit. See, we wear a scapular. We wear a big one. As a sign of her special love and protection. And you know you need protection against a lot of things these days. A lot of things. Not just from accidents, but you need protection from the enemy of God himself. Now, she said, this scapular shall be a sign, shall be to you and all Carmelites and all who have this privilege, that anyone who dies clothed, gee, it's a clothing, in this shall not suffer eternal fire, and if wearing him when they die, they shall be saved. Now you say, how can you do that? God can do anything. <laughs> Why you say how he can do that? You remember the Naaman the eunuch who had leprosy? And he went to the great prophet. He expected something great to happen. And the prophet said to him, go bathe in the Jordan there uh, seven times. He got angry. He said, hey, the rivers in my country are better than yours. I could have bathed in my own. And his servants had more brains than the eunuch did. He said, they said, look, master, if he had told you to do something hard, you'd have done it, would you? He said, yeah. Well, go bathe seven times. Then it got to hurt you. Well, every time he went in, he came out, he was better. On the seventh time, he was totally cured of leprosy. Now, Was that a healing water? No. The prophet, the prophet told him to bathe seven times and he was healed. If our sweet mother says, and she said it at Fatima too, that if you wear this little scapular, this brown material, she will protect you and she will give you many, many, many graces. A friend of ours in the last war had this scapular on, not this one, but one like it. And suddenly he, he was in a hole and he realized he didn't have his scapular. And things were very hot. There was bombs and bullets and everything else going around. And he decided, I'm going to look for that scapular. He got out of that hole, and he started crawling on his stomach, trying to find the scapular, and he found it. The moment he found his scapular, the hole he was in blew up. And he would have been blown up with it. See? So there's many, many miracles. Now, I am not, don't say Mother Angelica promised me a miracle. I didn't. <laughs> did not promise anybody a miracle. <laughs> but I am saying, see, our dear Lord doesn't ask us to do big things. Look at this. He said, if you give a cup of cold water, you get a great reward. What's a cup of water? But he didn't say water, did he? He said cold water. I thought that's great. Nothing like tepid water. Ugh. <laughs> Ooh, you can put a lemon in it. You can do anything. It's terrible. And he knew that. So he said, coal. You mean you got to make an effort to go way down that well and get the very cold water and bring it up. And what do you get? A reward for what? A cup of water. You know what gets me about the scripture? A lot of things get me about the scripture, but <laughs> this one says, if you receive a prophet because he is one, listen to this, you get a prophet's reward. Look at that prophet goes through. A prophet is criticized, a prophet is hated, a prophet is, oh, he has nothing, nobody likes him. 
and he keeps fighting for the Lord and fighting for the Lord. He's doing all of that, and you get the same reward just for accepting him. I think God is so good, and he asks us little things. So it itches. Well, <laughs> it's not as bad as purgatory. <laughs> All of my sisters, there were about seven of the sisters, young sisters, who were not enrolled. In fact, when they came, they didn't know what we were talking about. That <laughs> kind of gripes me. We live in a church that has awesome, awesome sacramentals. And you don't even know about it. These little things, you get a big reward for something. That's more. This is one of them. Now, this is a little itchy. It's wool. Now, God is good, the church is good, they understand how weak we are. He said, you can put a little piece of plastic on it, but I think you're chicken if you do. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. If, if you can't take the itch, get the plastic. But it must be brown, and it must be around your neck. Now, they have medals. For those of you that are mostly vain, or maybe you can't have any around your neck. Maybe you're allergic to wool. Whatever, they got a medal for you. I was on retreat Sunday. We take a, a day a month, and uh, I like to go on Sunday because it's a quiet day for me. And I just sit there with the Lord all day. I figure I'm not going anywhere and he's not going anywhere. So we just sit there together. And I started reading a little bit about St. James. I never, was never attracted to St. James in his epistle because it seemed to me kind of harsh. But when I got my wonderful Navarra Bible, I thought, oh, I suddenly began to love St. James because he had the whole spiritual life figured out, the entire one. I just want to read a few things to you that I thought were, I was enthused over. And I think it's, it's awesome. And if I lost my place, I'm gonna die right here. Where am I? Oh, come on. Ah, here we go. There we go. Now, it says here, we're talking about suffering. That has a lot to do with the scapular, a lot. Because all of us hate it. We hate suffering. We don't understand why we have it. We don't understand anything about it. And so we run away from it as much as possible. Well, it says here in St. James' Epistle, the commentary, it says human suffering has a redemptive value when born in union with Jesus. Let's, for example, think that you have a headache. Well, you can take an aspirin, you can take anything you want for it, and many times it just doesn't go away. Now, there's two things you can do. You can be very angry, you can be angry at God. Why do I have a headache? I've got so much to do. Or you could say, Jesus, I unite this headache with your crown of thorns, all the pain you had when you were crowned with thorns. Oh, when I was in, where was I now? Had to be Ecuador. Yes, Ecuador. And uh, this woman had us for dinner, and she had the most beautiful painting on the wall I ever saw. I wanted to ask her for it, but I didn't have the courage. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I mean, you can't meet somebody in two days asking for their painting. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you can't. So I had Gustavo uh, take a snapshot, but it didn't come out too good. But this was the painting. It was a, p a little pillar, and our Lord was lying down, and his head was on the cement, and he was whole back with bleeding. And there were little angels. Uh, on, one was on his, uh, near his head, and he had a little blue thing around him, and, and he was wiping his eyes, his tears with his little blue gown. And the other angel was horrified, and he was going like that. And then, right behind our Lord, our, our Lord's hands were tied, and right be behind our Lord was a tiny little angel, and he was going, he kissed the little the uh, index finger of our Lord. I, it was to me one of the most touching pictures I ever saw. And and then the other angels were kind of putting the blood that had spilled on the floor in a chalice. It, it was uh, it was awesome, awesome. And and I I, I realized you know that if I unite my back aches, which are always there. And, and I say, Lord, I unite my aches and pains to your aches and pains when you were scourged. You realize what happens, huh? You unite all your suffering to Jesus. And that's all you had to do. And the Father looks down at your little headache or your little backache, and he suddenly puts it all on Jesus. And together, it's redemptive suffering. See? That's what it says here. Now, I wanted to read you this because it should give all of you that have pain. It doesn't matter what kind of pain. Sometimes living with somebody is a pain. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe living with you is a pain. <laughs> And no matter how holy we are, or how, how well we get along together, there are times we're just a pain in the neck to each other. <laughs> and you can't help it. You can't help it. You like one thing and they like something else. The other day we got beans. We have a, a little farm and, and we're raising our own stuff. It tastes different. <laughs> And, and it's better. But anyway, here comes this purple bean. I never saw a purple bean in my life. And I said, what is that? He said, the purple bean. Said, I know that, but what is it? Said, it's a purple bean. I said, I know. I can see it's a purple bean. <laughs> what is it? And if you say it's a purple bean, I've got to hit you right on the head. <laughs> she said, well, I don't know what it is, except it's purple. <laughs> I said, well, why don't we open it up and see what's inside? I mean, you can't eat this thing. I, obviously, you can't eat it. It was kind of dried up looking, you know? <laughs> so we opened it up, and there were the freshest looking peas I ever saw. Just real Sprite. You know, did you ever see a pea that was Sprite in the pot? You never did? Then you never bought peas from the pot. They don't come in a can, you know? <laughs> And they don't come frozen either. <laughs> so here's this pea, and I start putting it down, and here it opened up with beautiful green inside. And I said, peas. And they said, no, they're beets. I said, they're peas. <laughs> <laughs> Looked like beads to me. I said, did you ever see a bean with a black dot in the center? No. Then it's a pea. <laughs> well, they were called black eyed peas. <laughs> and southerners love black eyed peas. In the north, you don't know what you're missing. 
because you have the little green peas. We got green peas and we got black eyed peas. And there they were. So everybody got together and we shelled them our, and our fingers were all purple. And I was excited because God put a dye. I bet you if we were Indians, we'd figure out how to use that dye. It was awesome. And today we had them and they were very good. Very good. But we differed over a pea <laughs> that looked like a bean. Now, we weren't angry with each other. We all ate them and we all enjoyed them. But life is full, 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 full of tiny, tiny little things that pass us by. And Jesus had the same things with these apostles. He said, well, I can't unite something so small to Jesus. Oh, yeah. Did you ever tell a joke and nobody laughed? <laughs> <laughs> They're looking at you like, well, <laughs> where's the punchline? <laughs> you say, you just heard it. I didn't catch on. Didn't that gripe you? I'm talking about a clean joke. So give me that. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of little things. See, for example, I like cream in my coffee. No, I like coffee in my cream. That's how it goes. <laughs> And so I was at, in, on a plane one day and I asked the stewardess for coffee and I said, half coffee, half cream. She said, why do you drink coffee? <laughs> I said, to put it in my cream. <laughs> why else would you drink coffee? <laughs> But she was annoyed, you know, she thought, ugh. Little things happen every day, a thousand of them, and it happened to Jesus with all the apostles. In a crowd, he said, who touched me? I said, you're kidding, Lord. You gotta be kidding, there's 5,000 people here. How do you, what do you say who touched me? No. Someone touched me because I felt power go out of me. A little thing, but they didn't know how to answer it. One day he said to them, what were you talking about on the way? Ooh, I bet they stood on one foot and then another foot and everybody said, well, it was nothing, Lord. I mean, we were just walking along. <laughs> now he said, what were you talking about? Talking? Yeah, talking. Well, uh, really, it was important. I know it wasn't important, but was it? I said, well, we were arguing about which one of us was the greatest. <sighs> he had to kind of sigh, I think. Because all these years, three of them, you know, he, they still didn't find the least was the greatest, the most humble was the greatest, and not the one that was on the top. And so Jesus had the same problems you have in anything. If you miss a bus and you go out and its sun is shining and all of a sudden it begins to pour and you don't have an umbrella and you're soaking wet. Little things in your life. Let me tell you what St. James says about them and what our Holy Father says about them. He said the gospel of suffering calls it the gospel. He calls your suffering and my suffering the gospel. And he said the gospel of suffering is being written unceasingly. It's written everywhere in every heart and every soul. The gospel of suffering is being written. And he said, and it speaks unceasingly. 
with the words of a strange paradox. Your suffering and my suffering in a little thing. And sometimes they're almost insignificant things. This morning we went and we made a we went around the house carrying the statue of uh, Our Lady Mount Carmel. We all had our brand new scapulars on and Father had prayed over us and we were enrolled, those for the first time and all of us, many of us are over again. And the sisters are carrying Our Lady, got so engrossed in the litany that they didn't realize that uh, sometimes she was going this way and sometimes she was going this way. <laughs> And they, I had holy water in one hand and a crutch in another. <laughs> and I'm trying desperately not to notice. <laughs> Our lady is going this way and this way. <laughs> so finally they're walking down and Our Lady hits the light. <laughs> I went, ah! <laughs> and it's, oh, we're sorry. And she's got a knot on her head. No, there's nothing. She, it didn't hurt her at all. Okay. Little things. Oh, there are nothing. Well, that's what it says. It speaks unceasingly. And this is the paradox that our Holy Father talks about. The springs of divine power gush forth. Gush forth in the midst of human weakness. Do you realize what he said? <sighs> the springs of divine power gush forth in our weaknesses. Why? <sighs> because they are mine. They are yours. And they, they, we're not happy with them. We want to get with them. And we seem to carry them on our shoulders day after day, day after day. But his power, that's what he said to, to Paul. He said, my power is at its best in your weakness. Why? Because when you overcome, when you overcome your weaknesses, whatever they are, that divine power is gushing into you. What an awesome reality. What an awesome reality. That the power of God is coming into you when you overcome, when you're kind and you don't want to be kind, when you're patient and you don't feel patient, when you listen to something you have heard a hundred times. <laughs> when you get on a bus and all the men are sitting and you're standing. <laughs> you know, Sister Charbel came to me the other day. She said, you won't believe what I found in this book. I said, try me. <laughs> she said, it says in here that when God created Adam and Eve, they were both equal. I said, they were? Yep. In the Garden of Paradise, they were equal. I said, don't tell me what happened. I know. Said, yeah, you know. Eve. Eve ate the apple and said to Adam, want a bite? <laughs> it was then that women became subject to men. And it says it. it. Says it right there in Genesis. I hate to tell you liberals something, but I got to tell you. <laughs> If you're looking for equal rights, you're too late. <laughs> it's been gone for centuries. 
and you're not going to get it back. Only the Lord God will bring it back. Because then we will equal in love. And now we're not. You see? I'm going to read you this one sentence again, and then we'll go for costs. Now this is what Elsie says. It's so awesome. They, those who share in the sufferings of Jesus preserve in their own sufferings a particle of the infinite treasure of the world's redemption. A particle. My suffering and your suffering is, is within us. It's the suffering of Jesus. And each one of us has a little particle, it says here, of the infinite treasure of the world's redemption. Wow. I'd buy this book if I were you. <laughs> buy this first, please. No, I'm going to give it to you. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> we have a call. Hello? Good evening. Good evening. And where My are you from? My name is Vincent. I'm from the Missouri. And what is and your question? I have a question about a brown scapular. Yeah? Uh, I have a scapular here with a picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And it says, Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary, protect us. And then on the other scapular, it's got a picture of the Immaculate Heart of Mary with her hand extended out. And say, whoever wears this scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. I wonder if this is just as good as the scapular you got. And also <laughs> <to> say, uh, <laughs> I don't know what you got, sweetheart, but it isn't what I got. Mine has a, it, Our Lady hugging the baby Jesus. You got that? Are you gone? Why you go? Because I'm not finished with you. <laughs> but that says the same thing that you have, and the two hearts are the same. I'm not too sure it'd make that much difference. If you have the Immaculate Heart of Mary on it, instead of her holy the baby. Our Lady of Mount Carmel statue is Our Lady holding the infant in her hand, and she has a scapular in her hand, and so does he. That's how he manifested themselves, they did, to the children of Fatima. I'm not too sure. It's long, what's necessary is this brown piece of material. The picture may differ a little, but the brown piece of material is what's important, because that is a symbol of the garment of Our Lady. And that's why we wear it, for her protection. And God knows we need protection these days. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? I'm from Lansing, Illinois. And what is your question? I would like to, lo to know how to enroll my family, and how do I go about doing so? Well, how do I say this? Get, find a priest who believes in the scapular, that, that's number one. <laughs> Tell him to look at the Roman, uh, it's not the Roman Missal, but it's, it's the Roman ritual. And in the Roman ritual, there is a beautiful, there's a one to, about three or four prayers. And then he, he has to put this on your head, like so. And I think if you get a Marian, a, a somebody, a priest that belongs to the Marian movement, I'm afraid some of our liberal brethren have dismissed or thrown away these very, very important sacramentals. In fact, I heard not too long ago somebody had sand in the, in the holy water fountain. I don't know what you're supposed to do with the sand. I don't know what you do with it. But anyway, it's supposed to be holy water. But the scapular should be enrolled. You have to have a priest. He may come to your home and do it. It would be nice if you and your family could just go in the church and, and kneel down and, and be enrolled. I, all of our sisters felt something very special 
when they were enrolled. And most of us were enrolled the second time. But I figured I don't remember being enrolled, and I figured if I didn't remember, I better do it again. But it's, I think it's very special. And, and you're protected. See, you're protected by my lady from eternal damnation. You got to be good now. You can't go around goofing off and say, well, I got a scapular on. <laughs> That's not going to save you. You have to be a son and daughter of Our Lady. You have to do what Our Lady please, and you have to be chaste in your state in life, whatever that is. You should be modest. And, you know, you need it. You need to be modest when you go to church. Oh, my. You would not look like you look if you were in England and were called to the presence of Queen Elizabeth. And why do you go in the presence of God? You see, he doesn't care. What do you think he is over there? You think he's blind? He does care a lot. Because it, it says to me, you really don't believe the Lord Almighty God is really present, or you would never walk in the church. And you men are no better than some women. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. How are you? I am very, very fine. This is Ken and Nancy from Aptos, California, calling. Wonderful. What's and, your question? Well, basically, we have two... Uh, uh, two things, uh, a little short testimony, and then also uh, for you and your sisters to pray for. First off, my wife, uh, about six years ago, I'll do this very short because I know you're short of time, and she developed diabetic retinopathy, which is a blinding condition of the eyes. Through our local parish priest who anointed her and a very good friend, uh, a neighbor, that gave her a scapular to... Uh, take with her during the laser surgeries of which she had and now I must say she was blind and we went to a specialist in Monterey California and he didn't give her much hope and now she's behind a camera taping weddings with myself ah uh, so praise wonderful. God and between the Blessed Mother and and everything else that happens uh, also I know you hear this 100 million thousand times this is television worth watching thank you Thank you very much. I, we get so many people that come back to Jesus because of EWTN. I told you last week about the, the missionary in the jungles of Colombia who watches the radio, who listens every night to the radio. And that keeps him working in the heat and the lack of food and all the dampness and the rain. Uh, if we saved one soul, just one, it would be worth all the years, toil, and tears that it took and takes for this network to go on. And I, I, I'm so grateful when we hear how powerful is the word. I told you, I made a bargain with the Lord when we started this 15, almost 15 years ago. I said, Lord, I'll get the signal from here to there and there to here. After that, it's your problem. <laughs> We've kept our part of the bargain, and he keeps his. I can't tell you how many souls away from the church, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, that come back fervent, living holy lives. So I just want you to know, and those of you that keep this network going, awesome thing, more than a cup of cold water will your reward be. For bringing a soul home is an awesome reward. And we have another call. Hello? Hello. Hi, where are you from? Uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And what is your question? Uh, it's a twofold question, sister. Um, my daughter was invited to a retreat by her best friend. Uh -huh. uh, it's a Lutheran retreat, and they had asked for uh, each participant is in an interdenominational retreat, mm -hmm. and they'd asked for each of the of the girls to have their pastors 
sign a letter that or uh, get permission for them to receive communion at the retreat. Um, of course, when we called and went to our priest, he said, no, uh, we can't do that. Um, but the daughter's 21 years old, and uh, the, the question that came back to me is that if Jesus were standing there distributing the communion, would he not give it to everyone? I'm clueless. I've talked to the deacon, I've talked to the priest, and, we, and I know where we stand as, as Catholics. On, but can she, and, and this is 20-year-olds, with their friends and their peers, what does she do? Um, I even suggested going up and folding her arms and not receiving communion and getting a blessing, and she says the Lutherans don't do that, and they look at you like, well, you know, why won't you receive Well, you can't compare to Jesus because Jesus only communion to the apostles. He didn't go out in the streets and say, hey, everybody, I, this is uh, the Last Supper. Everybody join in. He didn't say that. It's not right. Why? Because when you receive communion in a church, you profess their doctrine. That's the problem. See, you don't understand the problem. That's why my good Protestant brother can't come to a Catholic church and receive communion because he does not accept the teachings of the church. See, to him, it may be a, a symbol or maybe nothing. So you, you need to belong to the church and you take the communion of that church because that is what you believe. And you see, your daughter didn't do the right thing because what she said when she went to, I believe in this communion, well, she couldn't be a Catholic and believe in the real presence and then believe he's only symbolically there. And I don't really feel, I was in that situation one time, and I just, I just stayed there. They knew that. They know. And, and they know. I had nothing to do with my love for them. And when they came to Mass here, I had to say, you know, you can't receive communion. They understood. If I love my Protestant brother and he loves me, and we do, we have to understand each other's differences. But love goes beyond and above differences, but it does not go beyond obedience. So it had nothing to do that your daughter's 21. In fact, the fact she was 21 would say to me, she should have known better. <laughs> Not that she had a choice to make. Just because you're 21 doesn't mean you can make your own choices if you don't have an enlightened conscience or you know you shouldn't do something, you do it anyway. That's not. <laughs> That's not feeling of freedom of will. You have gone against something. That's, what you, that's where your will is. You went against something you shouldn't go against. And if my neighbor's love for me depends on my believing and, and accepting everything he believed, who are you going to love? You don't even believe all the stuff your husband believes or your wife. <laughs> well, are you going to stop loving now because he likes pizza and you hate pizza? <laughs> You make him pizza, let him eat it. Let him eat all of it. See, we can't, we can't just say, I'm 21. I can do as I please. No, I'm afraid you can't. Try it on a red light. <laughs> <laughs> let me know so I can stand on the corner. <laughs> That is not a true statement, see. So you tell your daughter, uh, she ought to, when she goes to confession, she ought to say that, you know, that she yielded to human respect. Eh, you know, we all do sometimes, it's unfortunate. We have another call, hello? Hi, Mother Angelica. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Conyers, Georgia, and my name is Cassie Williams. And what is your question? Okay, my question is, earlier you were talking about being enrolled by a priest for the brown scapular. Right. Well, you said that non-Catholics can wear it also. Yep. And my question is, how do non-Catholics, Protestants, get enrolled by a priest? Well, only a priest can enroll. A Protestant minister cannot enroll because he don't know anything about the scapular. <laughs> Besides that, he doesn't have the authority to put it on you or to say the prayers. But... 
The scapular is a sacramental. And because it's a sacramental, and it has with it a promise from Our Lady, you will receive many special graces and light, but a priest still has to enroll you. I'm sure if you went to any Protestant minister and said, enroll me in the scapula, he'd look at you and say, huh? <laughs> Are you scrupulous about something? What's the matter with you? No, because it's not their duty and they don't have the authority. See, I couldn't enroll you in a scapula. I could put it on you if your arms were broken. <laughs> I can't enroll you. See, we all have places, we all have things we can do. And so a priest has to enroll you. And my Protestant brother, I would go do that. You know, this is not a part of doctrine. And many of you uh, love Our Lady. You love Our Lady. And I'm going to ask you again sometime, when you're looking for a Bible that's true to the Word, and when you want a wonderful uh, commentary, commentary from the early fathers, from the scriptures, from Vatican II, run to your bookstore and get a Catholic Navarra Bible. There it is, Navarra Bible. If you want to really know the scriptures, I'd buy a Navarra Bible. It's awesome. And don't forget, all of you, this network is brought to you by you. And I sometimes shudder to think, if well, we wouldn't be if it wasn't for you. And so please be generous, will you? We have under wonderful things to do for the Lord. We're in 51 million homes. If every home gave a dollar, I wouldn't beg you for anything for five years. <laughs> Maybe seven if I stretch. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful if you never heard me ask for a dollar? Well, anyway, I don't mind. Yeah, I do mind. I mind a lot, but I have to ask. So please be generous. And this Bible is a series. The entire Bible, except the Old Testament, the entire New Testament, is all in small books like this with an awesome commentary. Look at this commentary. Look at that. Look at this one. I can't get over this one. It's this little thing over here. Do you see this little scripture thing here? Here's Latin, here's English. All that commentary. Awesome. You know, with the Navarre Bible, the Catechism, and Veritatis Splendor, you will be theologians of the first class. <laughs> Maybe even better than some we got. <laughs> anyway, it's time to learn about your faith. Time to know your faith. It's time to defend your faith. It's time to tell the truth, no matter what the consequences. We have too long yielded to human respect. We don't want to do this because somebody will think this, or somebody will think that, or I'm embarrassed, and I don't want to do this. <sighs> Go on, be brave, will you? <laughs> Does it make you popular? We're not here to win popularity contests. We're here to worship the Lord God and His Holy Son, Jesus and the mother of Jesus, and, and that total belief in the power of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, that I pray every day the Spirit comes upon the whole world again and gives us all a good shaking up, reveals, like old Joey Lamangino said the other night, reveals ourselves as we really are before God. No more pretending, no more faking it. We will know. I wait for that day because then we will love him with our whole heart and love each other as we should. I love you. Bye now. <laughs>